Well, the world has a growing population and many of those people, indeed uh, the bottom billion or two billion, have a quality of life which is quite abysmal. They lack the basic resources, even enough food, no electricity, etc. And I think a measure of our progress will be the extent to which we elevate the living conditions of the bottom billion or the bottom two billion and reduce the inequalities between the poorer parts of the world um, and the uh, more developed areas. And at the same time, I would hope that we should reduce the inequalities within the developed countries because they are going to be socially corrosive if they're allowed to continue. Of course, we have to ask how important a part of life is work. Um, for people who are fortunate, like myself, to work in uh, uh, science or something creative, work is an important part of satisfaction. Whereas you've got to accept that for many people, uh, the intrinsic satisfaction they derive from their work is limited. And so the important thing is to ensure they have a, a good uh, uh, lives for themselves and their family, and that they have security and they have dignity and respect. And one of the worries, of course, is that uh, um, the euphemism that's used of um, talking about flexibility in the labour market is another way of saying there's less security for the average worker. And I think uh, in order to uh, ensure that people have a satisfying life, they've got to have a degree of security and a degree of dignity and self-respect. So we don't want too much in the way of flexible working, too much in the way of zero hours contracts and things like that, because even within our country, they will reduce the uh, dignity and satisfaction of many people in their work. And of course, things are far worse in countries where the average income is far lower. I'm very lucky to work in a university, a Cambridge University, with wonderful colleagues and successive generations of young people. And it's inspiring to have the chance to interact with them and pass on what one has learnt. And I'm encouraged also that the younger generation is, unsurprisingly perhaps, more concerned about long-term issues of the climate and environment. Because many of those people who are now in school may live to the end of this century, even into the 22nd century, and naturally they care about what conditions would be like then. And so uh, it's therefore important to uh, ensure that they remain politically engaged and active. And if that happens, then one could be optimistic about these important long-term issues of environment, climate change, and ecological diversity rising higher on the agenda. I was very lucky in my childhood. I grew up in the country in Shropshire um, and was very fortunate in my home and my teachers. And uh, looking back, I realised that I was very privileged compared to most of the people I now work with to have had such a tranquil start. Um, I think I owe my uh, uh, being a scientist um, to having had a curiosity about the natural world from an early age and being encouraged in this. Um, and uh, then I went to university and after that was very fortunate to be able to develop a career um, studying science and studying a particular area of science, studying the large scale properties of the universe where there have been huge advances due to new technology and the space program and all that. So I've enjoyed for 40 years now participating in debates about the nature of the objects in the universe and uh, cosmology, cosmic evolution. And it's wonderful that issues that have been debated when I was starting have now been settled. And we're now addressing questions that couldn't even have been posed 40 years ago. And our understanding is greatly improved. So it's been wonderful to be part of this debate and now to be passing it on to the next generation. <laughs>